Thank you, Jesus. Glory, glory, glory. What a great team. What a great, what a great worship. Thank you guys so much for everything that you do. I'm always blessed by our praise team and what they do and how they bless our lives. And thankful to the Lord for the fact that uh, he's granted uh, us a wonderful group to play. All volunteers. I know many of you from other churches and many of you guys that are watching, you, uh, you also have praise teams. And these are all volunteer people that bless you and sacrifice their lives and sacrifice their times and their efforts and their energies in order to bless you and help you to have an experience with the Lord and uh, have a wonderful time with Christ. And so we do thank the Lord for that. Hopefully you got a little bit of air going. I know you guys were burning up. Um, and I could, I mean, I was too. I'm sweating. Yeah. Uh, but that's what happens this time of year when it's cold when you get here and as you fill up a place and it gets hot up in there. Um, and uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll get you going. Um, now, everybody that has been here in, in the past couple of weeks know that we are in a series on marriage and relationships for a couple of weeks, a few weeks. Matter of fact, I think today and then one other week, and then we'll kind of move into uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas times of the year and so forth. But uh, wanted to try to get our, um, you know, the holidays can be some of the toughest times for relationships. And, and I know this is not news to you, that, that you feel this and know this, and you possibly have been through times where it just seems like relationships, uh, whether it's family relationships or husband-wife relationships or love relationships, you know, you just, they just can become strained and become very difficult, especially during the holidays. I don't know whether it's because we spend so much time together or we, uh, you know, we're just doing things as a family and uh, there are always obstacles to do family things together. But I uh, thought we might try to head some of that off at the pass by sharing with you a few things that have been helpful for uh, Tanya and I for 41 years and uh, and for many of you that have been married a long time, I'm sure that, that these principles that I've been sharing with you aren't anything new, but uh, just call attention to them and to try to give you an, an opportunity to see some things the way uh, they can be helpful to you to see because, believe it or not, as you see the verse on the screen, God created us differently on purpose. Uh, the Bible says that God created he them male and female created he them. In other words, the inference of the verse is that God created two distinct genders of mankind. He created male and he created female. And that masculinity is to be distinguished from femininity. And that there are certain goals, qualities, and uh, attributes of males that that females do not have, and certain qualities, attributes, and goals, and traits of females that males do not have. And the sadness is that no matter which side of the gender of humanity you find yourself on, the other side is most likely somewhat of a mystery. Uh, we men have a, a phrase, ladies, and I know hopefully you won't be offended by this, but it's kind of like, that expresses this, uh, this frustration with not understanding women, you know. We, our phrase is women. <laughs> can't live with them, can't live without them. Uh, you women, uh, I have heard some women say this. I don't know if it's the radical ones, but they say, they have a saying also for us men, and it's uh, men. <laughs> can't live with them, can't shoot them, <laughs> you know. So I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to try to help you learn to understand this, all right? Okay, we want you to be able to live with us. And so we have, for the last couple of weeks, been going over uh, seven differences between men and women. I mean, there, if God created us different and he did it on purpose and he did it by design, and God did it in order to bless our lives and, and, and not to cause conflict and stress and anxiety and problems, but that the differences that God created us with are intended to complement each other and to be an asset to us and not to be a, a destructive factor in our lives. But in order for this to be true, we have to have some idea what these differences are because what happens as we live life, and this is true of men or women, and it is that however you feel, you feel that everyone ought to feel like you feel. And when you start living with your mate, what happens is 
what you feel that you need, you feel that they need. And so as you try to provide for them what you feel you need, it may not at all be what they need because, uh, as I said, God created us male and female, and we are created different by design. So we've been going over these seven differences, and we've re- come to the conclusion we're com- we've come to the last one today, uh, which is uh, the most uh, dynamic and drastic. Really, it is the most important of all of the differences. It is the one, in my opinion, upon which marriages either fail or succeed. You can have all of these other six things. You can understand them perfectly. Uh, the first one was, let's see if I've, I think I've got them up here in order. You have physical differences, and we understand that we're, we look different, and, you know, and some have long. Women are not just long-haired men and, you know, and so forth. Uh, they're different biologically uh, in the area of stamina, strength, a lot of biological and physical differences, not just aesthetic differences, but, but in the way God made us physically as human beings and every cell in our bodies are either all XX uh, for, uh, for ladies or XY chromosome for men, so every cell in your body is either masculine or feminine. And no matter how you try to identify yourself, we're living in such a crazy day, aren't we? Yeah. You know, I identify as a whatever, you know. I heard somebody yesterday on the radio, they were saying they identified as a 49-year-old man. They were 79 years old, but they said, you know, I identify as a 49-year-old. So I, I ought to be able to get a loan, I ought to be able to buy a house, I ought to be able to get my car financed. Ought to be, I mean, after all, you know, if you can choose to be identified as a female when you're distinctly male, I ought to be able to choose to identify as a 49-year-old even if I'm 79 years old. I mean, the lunacy of the craziness of the delusion of these times that we live in, uh, whew, God has to be patient with us, Right? But no matter what, you know, I mean, you can snip, snap, uh, add, pop, crackle. Uh, you can do whatever you want to do to yourself and mutilate and maim yourself, but you still all X or all Y, and you will be until the day you die. Ain't that pretty much, you know, what do you think of that? All X or all Y, and you will be till the day you die. There you go. All right, there you go. But we're physically different. We're different in the area of romantic response. Men are microwaves and women are crock pots. And that goes for what we said. And, and uh, we had fun with that. And you might want to watch that. Uh, you know. Then think we're different in the areas of the way we think and the way we feel. Men are concept-oriented. You know, remember, they're big headline people and women are fine print. So when you come home and you say, how was your day, honey? And he gives you that 12-second version with the big headline, fine. You know, uh, just know that that's kind of how men are. They're the big concept-oriented deals. And ladies, you like the details, guys. Recognize you might need to give her just a little bit more than the uh, 12-second version of your fine. And so uh, we're different in the way that we think and we feel. Men are deductive thinkers. Women are typically inductive thinkers. We think like a computer. They think like a good detective. They have satellite dishes that scan everywhere and pick up all the clues. Men have rabbit ears with tinfoil balls on the end of them. We don't pick up clues even if there are one, you know, and all that kind of stuff. We're different in the way we communicate. We think we speak the same language, but we don't speak the same language. Oh, we're speaking English, all right, or maybe Spanish or whatever language is spoken at your home, and you're both speaking it, but the trouble is you don't mean the same thing with the same words as you are speaking. You think you do, but you really don't. That's why your wife can say to you, well, I've told you a hundred times, and you can say, when? And I mean legitimately mean it. When? When did you do it? Well, when I said so-and-so, eh. oh, you meant so You know, here's why. Because women speak in code. And men do not speak in code. Men speak in order to convey information. That's one of the reasons why we get along with each other so well. You know, we say it, and then the man says, okay, he said this. This is what he means. All right, beautiful, wonderful. And you can work beside somebody that you hate for 20 years and not get all upset because we speak the same language. Ladies, you cannot work together. I don't care what you say. You have trouble working together. If you've ever worked, and I'm not trying to start a fight, and I'm not trying to make you not like me, and all of you know that I like women more than men, right? All right, so... I'm not trying to mess anything up. All I'm saying to you is that if you have ever worked with a group of ladies, you know what I'm talking about. 
They cannot get along with each other. You know why? Because when one of them speaks, the other reads code. <laughs> well, what she really meant was, I wonder if she's trying to tell me my dress is ugly. You know, she said I look pretty today, but I bet you what she really means is that my, me my makeup's messed up and my dress is ugly, and how dare her say something like that to me, would you? Be and round and round we go. Men speak in order to convey information. Ladies often speak in order to convey feelings. And so, you know, you can hurt your own feelings. You can by interpreting things that aren't in code. And I gave you the classic, uh, you come home to eat with me, uh, with Tanya and I, I fix steaks. Uh, you take a bite, you look at me, you say, uh, where'd you get these steaks? And I'm going to say, uh, Food Max or Winn Dixie or Sam's or Walmart or wherever I got them from. If you look at Tanya and say, Where'd you get these steaks? She's going to say, Why? What's wrong with them? <laughs> and so we're different in the way that we communicate. We're also different in the area of goals and relationships. Men are goal oriented. This is why we're driven. This is why we. Uh, get in an automobile and put the pedal to the metal, and baby, our goal is to arrive where we're going. And we want to get there faster than we've ever gotten there before, and we want to get there in a, in, a, in a better way than we've ever gotten. I mean, we have a goal. Ladies, you have a tendency to have life based on not goals, but relationships, and you're a very relational creature. And this is a wonderful thing because it makes you a really great mother. It, it lets you sense the, 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 the emotion of your home and, the, and, and what's going on in your children's lives. I mean, it, they're, they're wonderful attributes to being a relational person, but just know that men are not generally relational. We're generally goal-oriented, and it shows up in all kinds of ways and in all kinds of areas of our life that shouldn't cause problems, but you know, quite often do. <laughs> and, um, and so we, uh, we examined that, and then we looked at one other area last week, and that is in the area of spiritual receptivity. And this just simply means that in the area of uh, receiving spiritual uh, truth and, and, and responding to spiritual truth, that men and women are different in this, Men, like, like we know, are basically deductive thinkers. Uh, a is greater than B, B is greater than C, C, A is greater than C. And so when we hear the gospel, we start adding up things, we start uh, calculating things, we start evaluating things, we start trying to add up information and try to see, okay, is this something I need to do? Is this trustworthy? Is this make sense? Uh, do, am I ready to do this? Uh, I mean, we're, we're, thinking, we're thinking in those cognitive terms and, and, and we're trying to add up to a conclusion. And many times in the area of spiritual life, we just keep on adding for a long time. And, and, and it's okay. It's okay if you really do need some more facts or need some more information. It's all right to know what you're getting into and what you're being asked to commit to. That's fine. That's wonderful. If you need more information, great. Get some more information. But don't hide behind that left brain cognitive thinking and, and wind up in hell one day because you just were afraid to make a decision. Uh, that's what that's that's the danger in our way of thinking, guys. Ladies are generally, they hear the truth, they receive the truth, they sense that Jesus is worthy, they sense that He really does care, that He can be trusted, that He's the Son of God, and they're much more willing to commit quickly to it. If I preach the gospel and gave an invitation right now with this building filled with men and women, most likely, if all of you were lost and didn't know the Lord, it would be the women that responded first before the men. So we're different in the area of spiritual receptivity. Now today, the last one, and the last one, as I said, I think is the most critical of all and the most crucial because it is really the, uh, the essence of relationship. And I, and I want to show you this in a verse, and I, I'm going to have to read a few verses before I get there. I'm going to read out of Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 is the, is the chapter that is filled with information given to men and women, husbands and wives, and you'll recognize it as soon as I start reading it. But it also is a chapter filled with giving information to the church of the Lord Jesus. And what in, in Ephesians chapter 5, what the Holy Spirit is doing is he's comparing our relationship with Jesus Christ to our relationship with each other. 
And he's saying that just as we are committed to Christ and we have certain things that we commit to Christ, uh, that this is just like we do to each other. So he's trying to help us understand not only how to have a great relationship with Christ, but how to have a great relationship with each other. Now, I'm going to start at verse 15, and it's talking to the church first. Let's just get going in it. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil, and we know this. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. All right, good. All right, we've got this. He's going to tell us something about how we should be as, as people. Don't be drunk with wine in which is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. This is an instruction to the church. He's saying, look, you know, just like people who, uh, when they get filled with wine, they're excited, they're happy, they're free, they're loose, they're, uh, uh, they're forward. They're, I mean, be filled with the Spirit of God that way. Don't be filled with wine because you're going to lose your identity and it's going to be bad for you, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, which is what we did today. Uh, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. This is how when you get together, you act like this. You let the Spirit of God fill you and you sing and you celebrate and you worship and you praise and you make melody in your heart and you get excited about the Lord. And then he says, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh Uh-oh, here comes one that's a little difficult. Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, submitting to one, everybody say, to one another. Yeah, I want to say it one more time. To one another. <laughs> oh, hey, we listen, in, a, in just a moment, we're going to read a verse that says, all right, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, we all know that verse, right? And we, hey, you're supposed to submit to me. You know? The Bible says for you to submit to me. All right, yeah. But it also says for you to submit to me. You know, for me to submit to her. She's to submit to me, and I'm to submit to her, and I'm to submit to you, and you're to submit to me, submitting to one another. That in church even, I mean, you know, everybody says, well, the pastor, we obey the pastor. Well, I'm not saying that the pastor doesn't have a lot of responsibility and that God doesn't hold me responsible and that I should have enough respect uh, uh, to earn that you might listen to me. I'm going to tell you one thing I have found out being a pastor for 43 years. Once I say, I'm the pastor and this is what I say, then I'm not the pastor anymore. (laughs) If I have to tell you that I am in order to get you, then I'm not him, you know. But we're to submit to one another. In other words, we have an obligation to submit to one another in the fear of the Lord and that, and, that, and, and that God would lead all of us. And so what we have here, not only in a church, but in a, in a marriage, is a mutual submission society, basically, where we would be submitting to you and you would be submitting to me and we would both be submitting to the Lord and the Lord would be leading our life. And so... He leads us into this thought of male and female and women and men and husbands and wives with this kind of concept. Wives, this is the very next verse. Wives, submit uh, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And this is not difficult to understand. Because what is it that Christ is to the church? What Christ is to the church is the Savior of the church, the one who gave his life for the church. If, I sub- if, if, if Tanya submits to me like the church that submits to Christ, it is because she knows that I would die for her as quickly as I would draw my next breath. That there would be nothing that would prohibit me from giving my life in order that she might be blessed, that she might be saved, that she might be protected, and that she might be provided for in life. That's all Jesus did for the church is protect us, provide for us, fill us, give us, die for us, uh, 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 take us to heaven. Jesus did that. So what wife wouldn't submit to a husband who would die for her as quickly as he would draw his next breath? Husbands, here's your instructions. Love your wives 
just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That's your motive, guys. That's what, that, that, that's what a relationship is all about that I would make life better, that I would try to lift higher, that I would be able to present without spot, without blemish, without wrinkle, without any such thing, my opportunity, my life, my job as a husband is to protect and provide and be the priest of my home, and God has called me to that. And he says, all right, wives, uh, submit, your, submit yourself to someone like that. And then he goes on and says, so husbands ought to love their love." their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh You recognize that as a passage from the book of Genesis, right? Do you know that this passage, the first time it was spoken in the book of Genesis, was spoken to a man and a woman who didn't have a mother and father? Do you do recognize that, right? When he looked at Adam, he said, Adam, a man shall leave his father and mother. Well, Adam doesn't have a father or mother. What are you saying, God? Well, I'm trying to call attention to the fact that this is such a dynamic thing that I want this as a principle in relationships of life. I'm going to say it to somebody who doesn't even have a mom and dad, so everybody would say, why is he saying to him he doesn't even have a mom or dad? Well, God might really mean this, that we would have no other relationships that would be greater than this relationship that there would be no other commitments that would be greater than this commitment, and that nothing would be more valued or loved or respected or honored more than this relationship. And God would put us together and make two of us one of us. So yesterday when Brian and Tammy were married, and any of you other guys that, and ladies that are married to each other, the same thing happened when you were married. You walked in there as two separate human beings, a man and a woman living two lives, going two directions with two destinies and two goals and two determinations. But when you made a covenant at that altar and said, I do, and God joins you together, you are no longer two, you are one. I'm not Keith and she's not Tanya, we're uh, Keith Tanya, or Tanya Keith, whatever you want to say doesn't matter to me. We're both going in the same direction, following the same purpose, having the same goal, and my job is to help Tanya to be the greatest human being that God has ever created her to be, and her job is to help me become the greatest human being that God created me to be so that we both can serve the Lord in the way that God intended for our lives to serve the Lord. And so we submit to one another. We love one another. We honor one another. We lift one another. We walk the same direction. And he goes on to say, verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of us. In other words, he's, he's gotten it blended now, and I'm not going to make a big deal out of this, but, but what he's saying is, look, I've, he said, I've kind of mixed in talking about the church and, and Christ, and, but, but look, don't get sidetracked. Nevertheless, 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 let me tell you what the conclusion is, is in verse 33. Nevertheless, Let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, the point here in in this seventh difference is that in this verse, it identifies what men and women need from each other. And the reason it identifies it is because if it doesn't identify it, we're not going to know what it is. Because, ladies, you need love, and you have a tendency to feel that your husband needs the same thing you need, that he needs love in the same way that you need love. And so what do you do? You buy him cards. You uh, make cute little things and put it on the refrigerator. 
Um, you, uh, you, you do all kinds of kind things or nice things. Uh, you do all of these loving, kind, wonderful things, and, 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 and your husband is uh, basically uh, nonplussed. You know? uh, well, that's, that's nice, babe. I, thank you. That's so sweet of you to do that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you seen my socks? Um, <laughs> and the reason why is because this verse says, ladies, what you need is you need the security of being loved. And what your man needs is he needs the security of being respected. Wives need love. Husbands need respect. You say, what is respect? Well, the old King James Version has the word, let her reverence her husband. Now, that just means to worship him. And I know you're going, oh, wait a minute, that feels wrong. <laughs> You're going, that just feels wrong. Yeah. Well, the reason why is because you've somehow equated uh, some kind of competition between your worship of God and your worship of your husband. Now, we all know that there's no competition between the worship of God and the worship or the respect or the reverence of a husband, another human being. And he's not talking about put him on a pedestal like God. It just means that that he needs, to, he needs to know that you respect him, that you admire him, uh, that he is your man, that you feel safe when he's there, uh, and, and that he's unique and special in your life and that you respect him. That's what we men need. Women need love. Men need respect. And what does God command that we provide for each other? In Ephesians 5, 33, women you are commanded to respect your husband because that is what he needs. Isn't, I mean, isn't that genius of God, really? I mean, isn't it genius of God to create us with certain needs that only the other can supply? I mean, isn't it wonderful? And then he has the tremendous brilliance to tell us what it is that we are commanded to supply for each other. Now, here's, the, here's one of the kickers that the enemy uses, I think, lots of times in our life. Lots of times in our life, ladies, and, and I'm not meaning to, to, to dog this out on you, but it just kind of falls this way because of the language. M many times you, you feel that your husband is supposed to love you regardless. Hey, God told him to love me, and you know, if, even though I did something that was dumb or something that I didn't, he didn't like or something that was you know, uh, questionable or whatever it might be, uh, he's supposed to love me because God said you're supposed to love your wife. And that's exactly right. That is exactly right. God commands me to love my wife regardless of how I feel about it. But on the other foot, we have the tendency to think that respect is something that has to be earned. Well, if he'll act, if he would act respectful, I'd respect him. Or, you know, if he was worthy of respect, then I might respect him. Or if he would love me, then I might respect him. And I'm not going to respect him unless he, as if he earns your respect. I'm just reminding you that the same verse that tells him to love you says that you are to respect him regardless of how you feel about it. That in this area, what you are commanded is to respect because it matters. And so what happens in many relationships, and, I'm, and just follow this, what happens in many relationships is because uh, the wife is not sensing that she is being loved, she has the tendency to withdraw her respect. And then the husband, because he's sensing her disrespect, he then does not provide the love that she needs. And then because she's sensing that she's unloved, now she's not respecting him at all. And here we go. You know, here, here's what your relationship is doing right here, right down the bowl. And the enemy is standing over in the corner saying, that's just exactly what I want. Because I'm going to tell you the strength of the church, the strength of the nation, the strength of life are the strengths of these homes and families and relationships. 
And if you ask me, which nobody really is, but I'm up here talking, so I'm going to say it. If you ask me what's going on in our nation and in this crazy world we're living in is nothing but the results of the destruction of the home and the family. And that the enemy has found a way to infiltrate the home and the family and, and, and kill this country and kill our churches and kill this world at its root because the strength of life are families and relationships. And so what can I do in order to love my wife? Men, and I don't want this to sound too, you know, gooey gooey and and, and, you know, and, and, and romantic or anything. But, but just think, I want you to think about this. Most likely, and ladies, if this is not true, don't look at him and say, no, no. Just let it go, okay? Just let it go. Most likely, men, most likely, since your wife was a little girl, she dreamed that one day she would find someone for her life that would love her, and be passionate about her and would put her on a pedestal and honor her like no other man has ever honored her in her life. That she would march at the head of, of, of some man's parade and that he would love her and cherish her forever. And so God said, that's you. You are to love her and honor her. You are to meet that, that, that need in life. So, guys, how do you love your wife in a way that, that, that gives her what she needs? Do you just walk in every day and say, uh, babe, I love you. Hey, I love you. I love you. I love you. Hey, did I tell you I love you? I love you. I love you. you know I love you, right? You know I love you. Yeah, yeah, you know. No, I mean, is that it? Is that, would, is that, will that do it? I mean, is that what it's supposed to be? Is that, would that, would that be the, the kind of thing that would give her the security of knowing that she's marching at the head of your parade? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Let me, let me give you, let me give you a few little uh, pointers about it. I think it'll help you, all right? Because you say, how do I do this? All right, let me give you one. Let me give you about five of them here, all right? One of them, sacrifice. Uh, Ephesians 5, 25 says to, that we're to love our wife like Christ loved the church and he gave himself for it, uh, which means that I am to be willing to give myself for my wife as quickly as I would draw my ne next breath. All right, so the word sacrifice, think about it. What this means is that that, that basically you, you convince her that she is number one. Or, you know, because I'm bilingual, numero uno. <laughs> that she is number one in your life. Now, let me tell you what, how, to, how this is and what this means because I know you're going, oh, yeah, well, she is number one. She's number one in my life, right? Yeah. Well, except maybe for the, well, the children. The children, you know, I love my children, and, and I love them, and shoot, man, I love them more than life itself, so I guess, you know, yeah. well, you know, and then, you know, well, mama, you know, mama, she's, you know, she, I don't know, I, I, I make sacrifices for mama, and I, mama's kind of up there way on the top. And, and all I'm saying is, if she's number one, she's number one. Do you hear what I'm saying? More than the children. I, I, don't, I can't tell you how many people I see in life who put their children on a pedestal and their children are the center of their life. And I'm just saying to you, when you do that, you are undermining the security of your wife. You are saying to her that you love them more than you love her. And I'm not saying this. this I mean, it's not some petty, childish kind of stuff where she's saying, well, I'm not number one. No, no, no. This is a need. Everybody say, a need. A need. This is not a want. This is a need. This is what must be had in order for mental, emotional, and personality and everything else to be what it needs to be. This is a need. 
Man, you can't fight a need. I mean, a need is a need. And she needs the security of being number one, not being placed on the black number three on the list. So you convince her, and you, you, I mean, anytime there's an opportunity to show that she, buddy, she's treasured over everything else in your life, the dog, the cat, your children, or mama, you know, whoever it might be, convince her that she's number one, and it gives her the security of being loved. Now, I could say more about that, but don't need to. I don't want to make you mad. Number two, honor. Uh, in Proverbs 18, uh, the Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. And, and it, now that's not all, that is right. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Now, now follow with me, and some of you have heard me say this before. All right, uh, it seemed, that, that verse seems a little awkward because it's like, okay, if I find a wife, she's already married. I mean, you know, it doesn't say, he who finds a <laughs> He who finds a virgin, you know, <laughs> finds a good thing. No, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. That's just God's way of saying, look, if she's not a wife before you put this ring on her finger, she's not going to be one after you put it on there. In other words, some, before, before, before I, Tanya and I even got married, Tanya was a wife because that was her nature. That was her desire. That was her drive. That was what she wanted to be. She was a wife before we put her finger, ring on that finger. The Bible says, and he who finds a wife finds a good thing. And it doesn't stop there. It says, and obtains favor from the Lord. So God is telling you, men, that if you find a wife, that wife is going to give you favor with God. In other words, God's going to bless you through that wife. And so... What that means is that your wife is a gift from God to you that is going to give you favor with him. And so when I say honor her, to honor something means that I exalt it. It means I lift it up. It means I put it on a pedestal. I set a high value on it is literally what it means. I mean, we have, uh, and, I, and I, I don't understand how all this is, but, but you know, we have a whole nation uh, across the water over there that uh, has this little lady about this tall, and she's about 90 years old now, and, 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 and she got this crown on, and they call her queen, and they put her on this high pedestal. Uh, I still don't really understand all the concepts of why someone would do that, but, but regardless of that, uh, they, they, they set her high, they hold her to a standard because uh, they want to honor her in life. But when you honor something, you set a high price, you set a high value, you put it on a pedestal, you lift it up, you, you look at it as if it's a valuable, blessed thing in your life. You know, the, in, in Proverbs 31, the Bible describes a, a virtuous woman, and, and it's describing a, a wife. And, and this wife, it says all these tremendously great things about her. And, and then it says, and her price is far above rubies. And it just tells you how blessed and how enriched and how honored and how favored we are by the mate that God has given us, guys. And so treat her that way. Here's a third one. Affirmation. Um, in the Song of Solomon, and, and, and those of you that were here when we read about the romantic response part of this difference, uh, in the Song of Solomon what we learned was words are important, right? Because men have been created by God to be stimulated through the eye gate. Remember? This is why pornography is such a plague for men. This is why men are so captured so quickly by visual things. The enemy uses that and, and takes that, 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 that creation of God and, and, and subverts it and uses it against us. So we're stimulated by what we see. Well, women are stimulated more, more. And I'm not saying that women don't like to see nice-looking people. I'm just saying that women are more stimulated by what they hear than what they see. So if you want to bless your wife, you'll need to learn how to talk good, okay? And by, and in other words, you need to say things to her. You there 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 was a there was a. Uh, an experiment done in a high school. 
And in this high school, they took, they took boys and girls and they brought them into a room, uh, brought the boys into a room and kind of left them alone, and then brought the girls into another room and just left them alone and, and, and told them, hey, we'll be back in a few minutes. And there were some chairs around the wall and said, okay, uh, hey, look, we're going to leave you here a few minutes. We'll be back in just a minute. Hey, you guys, you know, make yourself at home, be comfortable. We'll be right back. And what they found was when the girls moved the chairs in order to be comfortable and they kind of partnered up with somebody in the group that their chair, the girls' chairs faced each other, face to face. Men's, the men put their chairs side by side. And what that tells you is that, guys, when you want to communicate with your wife, you need to do it face to face. In other words, you don't need to be just talking while she's in the kitchen and you're in the living room and think that you're, oh, this is really what, this is a good. I mean, she needs a little bit of face-to-face -face time. This is why when you go out to restaurants, now listen, have you ever been to a restaurant and, and you can just walk into a restaurant and, and you can tell who in that restaurant, if they're couples, who've been married a long time and those that are just uh, new with each other and all that, you can tell who they are, right? Because the new ones, the little new ones, they're sitting there and, and they're sitting across from each other and they have their hands up on the table, right, most likely, and their hands and they're, they're holding hands with each other and, and they're looking into each other's eyes and they're just talking and they're smiling and they're, you know, just having a nice look. Well, yeah. And you can just look at them, look at them, look at them. And then the people who've been married a long time, they're sitting there looking at their watch. They got this phone out yeah. and barely say each other, a word to each other. <laughs> one day, one day, one day, a couple went into a restaurant and they were sitting beside this little couple that were obviously new and they were sitting there holding hands and looking into each other's eyes and oh, it was so romantic and so intimate and all that. And the wife looks at her husband and says, honey, why don't you ever do that? And he said, well, hon, I don't even know that woman. <laughs> what I'm... What I'm saying to you is that, guys, if you, want to, if, you, if you want to affirm, you want to speak things that are uplifting, encouraging. Hey, look, let me just ask you, guys, do you want her fantasies to be about you? Well, talk to her. Give her something to think about. Give her something to, to, to strategize with. Let her know how you feel about her. Tell her things like, that is, that, that's a brilliant idea, or that was a wonderful suggestion, or you have such good taste, or my goodness, how do you do that? I mean, you, there are lots of things you can say that are affirming and positive and great. You think them, you need to say them. And then she'll have the security of saying, my man loves me. Yes, sir, buddy, he does. And then number four, security. And I'm going to have to pick up the pace or y'all be here later. Um, security. The number one uh, acute need of women, according to psychological surveys, is the need for security. This is why women ask so many questions, by the way, guys, because she needs to feel secure. The reason that she asks so many questions is because you don't tell her anything. If you tell her something, then she doesn't have to ask questions about it, like uh, about, your, about the money in the family, about the children, about your job, about your home, about uh, what's going on in, in, in our community, about, I mean, anything. If, if, if any of those things can undermine the security of a person, it's like, it's like uh, every once in a while, uh, you, need to, you, you need to hear we're doing okay. I mean, our money's good. Uh, the job's fine. Uh, I got a promotion or whatever it might be, or uh, we're doing good, or we can afford that, or hey, yeah, uh, you know, I looked into this, and it's going to be all right, and we've got funds, and we've got life, and, 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 and the yard looks good, and the fence is right, and everything's good, and the refrigerator's fixed and the ice maker works and, uh, you know, I mean, all of that kind of stuff brings security. And women need security. So you say, I want my wife to know I love her. Well, hey, help her be secure. 
That's what they need in life more than anything. And then number five, excitement. Uh, sprinkle a little hot sauce on life, okay? Um, I, I, I'm going to use a, I'll use a passage here, and you'll say, oh, you're just trying to stretch something. But you remember, you, do you remember the first public miracle that Jesus did? Where was it? It was wedding at Cain of Galilee, right? Yeah, that was his first public miracle was done at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. What was the miracle about? Well, he was at this little wedding, and they ran out of wine. And it was going to be an embarrassment, and, uh, you know, everybody was there, and they were expected. And so Jesus didn't want him to be let down. And, and, and so Jesus, uh, uh, Mary uh, got called Jesus, and he said, that no, doesn't have anything to do with me. But she looked at the servants anyway and said, hey, whatever he says to you, do it. And, uh, and so he said, go fill these water pots with water. And he, and he brought them back. And, and, when they, and when he brought the water pots back, the water got sunburned in the presence of the glory of God and turned into wine and uh, right there in the front of everybody. And they, and, uh, and they dipped the stuff in and they started drinking it. And they said, you know, uh, most people say the good, uh, uh, most people serve the good stuff first. And then when everybody's tanked up and can't tell the difference, then they bring out this old nasty stuff. But you have saved the best for last. Now, all I'm saying is that's a good example of putting a little hot sauce on it. This is a good example of doing something that is not necessary but makes things lots more fun. You know, I mean, uh, in other words, plan some some break from the mundane. Uh, do it uh, a night out. Uh, go into the, uh, a nice uh, romantic restaurant. Not, you know, baby, we're going to put on the dog tonight. Put on your good clothes. Yeah, we're going down to McDonald's. That's what we're going <laughs> to No, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, give her a reason to dress up. Uh, 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 go to some place where they turn the lights down low, and you have to pull out your little magnifying glass to read the, you know, to read the the, the menu because it's so dim and dark in there. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, where you can sit face to face, and you can, you know, uh, uh, get all the things. Yeah, don't. And, and look, here's another thing: if you're going to do something like this, plan all the details. By that, I mean, remember, I talked about women needing security. Uh, plan all the details. Like, say, say to her, when you start to, when you start to uh, say, we're going to go out, here's what you need to say. You need to say, okay, uh, baby, I got, a, uh, I got a raise last week at work, so we've got a little bit of extra money, so I want to take you out tonight. And I've called Aunt Susie, and she's going to take care of the kids, and she's going to be here at 7 o'clock. And, uh, and if you will, you know, dress and, and look nice, because we're going to go over to so-and-so, and, -so, and I made the, I've already made the... Uh, the arrangements, and I've already, I've already got us a place and all the time. And in other words, take care of all the details and tell her that before or as you ask her, because if you don't, the first thing she's going to think is, can we afford this? How much is this going to cost? Who's going to take care of the kids? Where are we going? How do I need to dress? What time do we need to get there? What time are we planning to get? You see all these questions, all these questions? So if you answer all the questions before you ask her, Hey, presto, no questions, no insecurity, no. <laughs> Got it covered, babe. Don't just call her and say, hey, why don't you plan for us to go out tonight and then leave all that stuff to her. No, you put the hot sauce on it. You, you do it. You get the romance. You get the excitement going. You get... <laughs> I mean, look, she got it. Look, she got a, She's got to. Uh, she wash. You know. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like women. All they ever do is stay in the kitchen and wash dishes and all that. But, but, but. I mean, all of the mundane stuff that you do. We need. You need a break from that every now and then. And guys, if you want to say I love you, there you go. There's a perfect opportunity. Sprinkle a little hot sauce. Make a little excitement in life. All right, women, you're supposed to respect men, and I'm, I'm going to give it to you in just a second. Uh, because I, I don't want to last this, hang this over. Can you hang just a second? Are y'all all right? Is everybody all right in here? Okay. All right. Let me give it to you. I'm going to give it to you quick. All right. Show respect. <laughs> Show respect now. I, don't... <laughs> I heard that snicker. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to come on. All right. All right. Submission. Um. It tells wives to submit themselves to their husband as unto the Lord because the husband loves you so much. Now, what this is talking about is 
that God has an order for everything. And God has created an order for the, for the family, for relationships. And he says, all right, husbands, I'm holding you responsible. And you are going to be the shepherd of your family. Now, a shepherd is someone who takes care of the, the sheep. Uh, in John 10, you know, Jesus talked about, I am the good shepherd. And my sheep hear my voice and they follow me and I keep the thieves and robbers out and, and nobody's going to steal my sheep and take my sheep. So as, as Christ is for the church and our spiritual life, he says that we husbands are held accountable before God. Now this just simply means that the home has a head. Anything with no head is dead. And anything with two heads is a freak. <laughs> so a home cannot have two heads, but it must have one. So God says, you guys, you are the head. Now, ladies, if you want to respect your husband, let him be the shepherd. And that means if he's the shepherd, you're the sheep. And it means you're going to follow him, and you're going to walk with him, and where he leads, you're going to go without reminding him that he's walking off the cliff or that he's not leading like you think he ought to lead or you're not going like he ought to, you ought to go. Let him lead. And if he's not taking you somewhere that's illegal or immoral, follow his lead. That says, I respect you, I honor you, and you are the shepherd of my life. Let me give a go on. Companionship. Uh, one of the primary ego needs, or one of the primary needs of man, is the need for companionship. It's like number two. Would you like to know what number one was? <laughs> Sexual fulfillment. Okay, all right, just so you know. I just want you to know how high in the needs hierarchy of man's life companionship comes up in here. Companionship is where bowling teams, softball teams, uh, going down to the bar, having the buddies, uh, playing pool, uh, uh, going to the races, playing golf, uh, going to a ball game. Uh, all of those things are about companionship. The Bible says that our wives, men, uh, in Malachi chapter 2, it's talking about getting divorced and all that, and God's making a charge against the people for putting away their wives and stuff like that. And he, and he chides them, and he puts them away. And he says, I'm angry at you because you have thrown away the wife of your youth who I've put in your life as your companion for life. Now, that word companion means compatriot, which which soldiers know means uh, somebody that you can stand back to back to in battle. So God says that our wives, guys, are someone that we can trust to have our back, that we can, that we, that, 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 are, that God has put in our life to be right there with us. Now, all I'm saying, ladies, is remember our little deal with the classrooms and the men and the, boy, and, and the women, and the women put them face to face, and the guys put them side to side. All right, what that means, ladies, is that your man relates to people side by side, which if you watch men talk to each other, many times men will sit down beside each other and just talk to each other like, hey, man, did you see that? That was a good pass, wasn't it? I mean, they won't even hardly look at each other. And men love to do things that don't take much talking. <laughs> things like hunting. Things like uh, playing golf, uh, things like going to a ball game, uh, uh, sitting there watching TV, you know. I mean, they do things that don't have to talk a lot. So ladies, I'm just telling you, if you want to meet a need that your husband has and you want to be his companion rather than him going down to the boys, then you need to learn how to do things side by side with him. And you can become his best friend, somebody that he wants to be with, somebody that he loves to be with. And, and, and that is a sense of respect. My wife respects me. I'll, let me move on. Silence. Now, by silence, 
by silence, I know I, I hear you all reading it the way I thought you would probably read it. <laughs> You're reading it by, by talking about, uh, by thinking that I'm talking about, uh, don't make any noise. Don't, don't, don't say things to him. What I'm meaning by silence is uh, choose to be silent instead of contrary or ridicule or belittlement or something like that. I, I'm, I'm talking about being, choosing to be silent instead of opening up and blasting him on something. Because believe me, we're going to give you a bunch of reasons to blast us, right? But instead of doing that, you can choose to just let some things go, right? Yeah, choose to let it go. Uh, uh, like, you put, he's putting something together and you say, um, it might help if you'd read the instructions. <laughs> How about that one? I mean, obviously he hasn't thought about that and honestly, you know, you, you, you need to tell him that, right? I mean, choose silence at that point. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, in, in First Peter, you say, where, Scripture? All right, First Peter, you know, it says that some men are not going to believe, but some will be led to believe by the uh, chaste conduct of their wife who without a word wins them to the Lord. That, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about choose, choose your words. Choose and choose your times. Uh, uh, like, uh, here's another one. Can, can we please stop for some directions? Okay, there's another time. <laughs> just, 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 just choose to do that. <laughs> and don't order him around like he's one of your children. And don't embarrass him in public. And don't say things that are a shot out where other people can hear you say that. Uh, that's all of that is it, it undermines it undermines uh, respect and it just says I, I don't respect you 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 I have to treat you like a child you're one of my kids uh, I got to tell you everything to do I mean this is just see see how subtle some of these things are beauty beauty me look every person in this room who is married is married to someone who thinks they're a 10. I know you don't believe that. I know you don't. I, I know you, you know, you look at other people and you look at some beautiful people and this world is filled with beautiful people, male and female, just gorgeous people. And you look at yourself and you're thinking you're not one of them. And you're thinking, I bet he likes her better than me or he would like to have her more than me or she's more interested in him than she is me because you're looking at yourself. But I'm going to tell you something. If, if, if they chose to marry you, they love you, and they want you. They desire you. And so beauty here, ladies, I'm, I'm, I don't want you to get all, um, oh, what, what word would I be looking for? Uh, I want you to get all undermined and, 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 and feel like, you know, you need to be a 10 all the time and you need to doll up and be Cosmo magazine or something or another. I'm just saying that uh, if you will attempt as much as possible to present yourself to, you, to your man, that that will be seen as a sign of respect. Because, uh, and and I'll follow my thinking. If you had someone coming to the house to fix the pipes, would, would, they, would they catch you looking like something that the, the cats drug in and the dogs wouldn't drag back out? <laughs> Most likely, you would, at least, you would at least comb your hair or put a little bit of something on. I mean, because somebody's coming in the house that I don't know. And I don't, you know, I mean, if you'll do that for a perfect stranger that it doesn't, they don't even know you, they'll never see you again, why not do it for somebody that, that you love and, and that, that does love you and, and does come home to you and does desire to be with you? That's, that's all I'm saying to you is God, use the beauty that God has given you 
and just kind of uh, frou frou up a little bit, you know? You don't have to be, you don't have to go overboard and do all of that and be, you know, uh, some provocative model every time he walks in the door. I'm just saying, use, use what God gave you, you know, and, that's, and, and he'll appreciate it. All right, and number five, affirmation. And I really should have put, and if you want to write beside it, uh, you could write beside it, mercy, okay? By affirmation, I'm really talking about mercy. And, and this is... Uh, where I want to encourage you to just let some stuff go. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a term that's used in, in, in carpentry and brick mason and construction work, and it's the term plumb. And, and you know, you, you, I don't want to explain all that, but, but anyway, <laughs> it, it's the word plumb. And it just, it's a measurement of something being perfect. All right, now, in life, there are few situations that are plumb, plumb. You get what I mean? Very few situations in relationship life, romance life, are they plumb, plumb. But they are plumb some. And sometimes plumb some has to be good enough. Right? So... In area, ladies, you guys are going to do a lot of stuff that's not going to be plum plum. But it's going to be plum some, and he's got a good heart. So if it's plum some, that's going to have to be good enough. And I'll give you an example, and I'm quitting. All right. When I, when Tanya and I have been married all these 41 years, and when we first got married, uh, we were both working. I was trying to finish school. She was working. I was working. We had a busy, busy time. We had no children, of course, but, but we, we I, and I, I, I happened to work. We had, a, we had a mobile home that we lived in, and, uh, and I worked close to where we lived, and so at lunch, I could go to our home and uh, try to clean up the house and do some things to try to be helpful. Well, one of the things that I used to do was I, <clears throat> I used to wash clothes, And um, I, I mean, I was, I was trying to do the best I could. I, I, I mean, I, I thought, okay, you just put the detergent in, you put the clothes in, and then you just wash them, and then you get them out and throw them in the dryer and dry them, and then everything's gone. I didn't know all this stuff about Clorox on the whites and all this kind of stuff, and that you don't wash some colored stuff with other colored stuff and things like that. I, I, I mean, seriously, I, I really didn't know that. And so I did, I washed, and so I washed for, you know, a month or so, and after about a month or so, all the whites looked dingy and, you know, all that, and the, and the colored stuff, some of it had faded and some of it, you know, had, but one day in particular, I, I, I'll never forget this, one day in particular, uh, I put some clothes into the dryer, and I dried them, and then and they got finished before I had to go back to work. So I got them out, and I was, you know, trying to put them out so they wouldn't wrinkle back up. And one of the things that was in the dryer was this uh, sweater, Tanya's, one of Tanya's sweaters. And, uh, and, and I, I pulled it out of the dryer... And so that afternoon, <laughs> when Tanya got home, I said, babe, I've got some good news and some bad news. And she says, well, give me the bad news first. I said, well, I pulled the sweater. <laughs> I said, I shrunk, I, I shrunk your sweater. And she said, well, what's the good news? I said, well, if we have a daughter, she'll already have a sweater. <laughs> And she, now, now at that point, at that point, she could have crushed me. She could have belittled me. She could have told me, you don't know better than that. How old are you? Uh, how, you've got to do better than that. I mean, she could have, she could have, she could have demotivated me for probably half of our marriage to try to do anything nice again. But she didn't. She just looked at me, and she took her little sweater. <laughs> and she said, that's all right. We can get more sweaters. 
And she said, and she said, don't, don't. And, and then she looked at me and she so kindly said, oh, don't, and don't worry about washing anymore. I, I'll take care of that. <laughs> now that, that was mercy. That's what I'm talking about. That wasn't, I mean, my heart was good. I wanted to do something good, but I just didn't do it right, and it turned out bad. So that wasn't plum plum, but it was plum sum. <laughs> and so plum sum was good enough. <laughs> All right, stand to your feet. Will you?